thing I want to explain this morning is what I'm wearing. Uh, our church is, our theme for this month is March Madness. So uh, we were asked to wear uh, shirts or whatever that would reflect the team that, uh, our favorite team. So go Shocks. I uh, hope they uh, do well today and in the coming March Madness. I uh, also wanted to tell you that uh, Doyle and I are going to Israel. We'll be leaving this week, so uh, we will be gone for three weekends. And Brother Gary will be teaching two of those. And Gary, where are you? Uh, and um, hopefully, uh, Gayla. Gayla Slice. Hopefully, if it works out, she's going to come in one Sunday and show you. Uh, her uh, slides of when she went to Israel just recently. So you'll be able to see where we're at and what we might be doing uh, by looking at her slides. So anyway, Facebook Live, I will not be on for the next three weeks because we'll be, uh, we'll be gone and in Israel. And please pray for us. And um, we're, we're looking forward to it. And we'll certainly be praying for you. We're going to finish our study in Psalms today, not because there's not other Psalms that we could look at and study, but because I felt like being gone three weeks and taking a three-week break that when we came back, we would start something new. So I'm going to finish the study in Psalms today with Psalm 36. Psalm 36. I'm finishing with this Psalm, and I have saved it for the finish, because it, uh, in verses 1 through 4, it gives us the reasons why human love sometimes fails. And in 5 through 9, it gives us the assurance that God's love will never fail. And then 10 through 12 is experiencing God's love. So the first uh, four verses that we'll be looking at talk about a self-centered life. Some, a, an unbeliever, someone who does not believe in or trust uh, Jesus Christ or God. And um, verse number one, it says, Sin whispers to the wicked deep within their hearts. Sin whispers just that little nagging thing whispers to the wicked folks deep within their heart so we see two things come into action here one is who is the father of all lies and lead okay, satan and then also there's our flesh you know the bible says in this flesh dwelleth no good thing my flesh always wants to act ugly, and so does yours, because that's what our flesh does. So it speaks deep to their, Satan speaks deep to, into their heart, into their flesh. And they have no fear of God to restrain them. You know, a fear of God is not, oh, I'm afraid of God. We should never be afraid of God. We have no reason to ever be afraid of God. But the fear that the Bible speaks of and, and speaks that we should all fear the Lord isn't to his awesomeness, knowing that he's all powerful, knowing that uh, he has all knowledge, and just knowing what a huge and great and wonderful God that he is. Who would not have uh, an awe of that? And that's the fear that it's talking about. And that fear that you have of God's awesomeness, that respect that you have for who he is, my friends, it restrains us, doesn't it? God's word restrains us. Some things I don't do because God's word says not to do it. It restrains me. There's some things you don't do because God's word constrains you. Because God's word says not to do it. I would like to say that anything that's in God's word, we don't do. But boy, that'd be stretching it a little, wouldn't it? So I want us to remember, folks, that even 
though we're saved, you and I still sin. That's why, my dear friend, we need a Savior every day. So when we sin, we need to confess that to the Lord and take care of it. Admit it. Agree with God. When we sin, that's what God wants us to do. You know, when, when your children do something and you say, did you do that? What do you want them to say? You want them to say, yes, I did that. But sometimes they don't, do they? Oh, no, I didn't do that. When you know they did it. Well, God wants us to admit our sin, to repent of our sin. You see... Let me just put it away that we'll, we'll all recognize it, including me. Take a look at your own heart right now. Look inward. Do you want to sin? I don't. Do I sin? Yeah. That's the difference, my friend. If when I say, do you want to sin? And you say, no, I don't want to, but I do. Your heart's good with God. Because God's word restrains us. But we're not perfect and never will be. As long as we uh, walk this earth, folks, we are going to, we're going to sin. And I started saying make mistakes, but I believe in calling it what it is. We're going to sin. Oh, I'm glad we got a Savior that died for our sins. I'm glad we've got a Savior that hung on the cross so that you and I can be saved and so that you and I can be forgiven. And the blood of Jesus Christ, my friend, takes away all sin. We're a blessed people, aren't we? But we're not talking about us right here. We're talking about, in the first part of this psalm, about people who don't have that assurance, people who don't have the Lord to restrain them. Verse number two says, in their blind conceit, they cannot see how wicked they really are. In their conceit. They, he flattered this person that the scripture is talking about. He flatters himself that he's always right. And, and, uh, and you know what? As Christians, we need this. conceit is something that we need to be on guard for. It can slip into a Christian's life as well. We need to be on guard for that. Verse number three says, everything, everything. I drew a circle around that. It's like the word all. You know, what, what does it mean when it says everything? It means every single thing they say is crooked and deceitful. They refuse to act wisely or to do what is good. If an unsafe person saw their sin from God's viewpoint, they would hate it. Now, when you see your sin from God's viewpoint, if you're a believer, you hate it. Verse number four. They lie awake at night, hatching sinful plots. <coughs> they lay awake at night, hatching sinful plots. It means from the moment they get up until the moment they go to sleep, their mind is on evil continually. You say, well, you know, I know some pretty good people. I don't think they do all of that, but they're not Christians. Listen, I know some pretty good people that are not Christians as well, that are good by the world standards. But let me show you, uh, turn over to Philippians 13. I think that might be a good trick if he could do it. If I remember right, it only has four, doesn't it? Okay, let's do three then, okay? Oh, yeah. My one in the 13 was the L on Philippians. <laughs> All right. Philippians 3, 17 through 21. Listen to what the New Testament says. 
as soon as I can find it, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, my book has the wrong scripture there. Uh, well... Uh, okay, I'm not going to keep looking. Okay, I'll let you find it. I evidently have put the wrong book down, so, uh, but I'll let you find it. But in the New Testament, in one of those Ephesians or Colossians or uh, Philippians, one of those short ones over there, uh, it tells us the same thing that people are enemies of the cross. Uh, Paul said in that letter, he said, I speak to you with tears in my eyes that there are people who are enemies of the cross. And folks, if a person hasn't accepted Jesus, they don't think of themselves as an enemy of the cross, but that's what the Bible says. And Paul said, I speak to you with tears in my eyes. And you know what? That's the way we should do it. If somebody isn't saved, we should not be judgmental of them. We should not uh, offer our opinions of whether they're saved or not. But what if somebody is an enemy to the cross or somebody is not saved, it should be with tears in our eyes that we pray for them. We should have a broken heart for them, not a judgmental heart. Not a heart that says, wow, they'll never get to heaven. No, tears in our eyes that their heart will change. Because Paul, for an example, he was a pretty bad guy. He really was. He was an enemy of the gospel. He killed Christians because they were Christians. And he got saved and, and wrote several books of the New Testament. You missed it by one verse. I did? <laughs> well, let me get back over there then because that's a good scripture. <laughs> I wanted to take the time just to look through there because I felt like it would be there somewhere. But then you can take a lot of time and it's not there. Okay, tell me where it's at. 318. Philippians 3, 18. 18. Very good. Thank you. That is it. I want to start with 17. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. Let me ask you a question. Now, when somebody gets saved, when they first get saved, we say, you need to live like Jesus. Let him be your example. You know what? That is a big step. That is a big step. But what if we could say, watch me and do what I do? Okay, now let me ask you a question. Are you shaking your head at that? Are you saying, I'd never tell anybody to watch me and do what I do? Well, then, my friend, you need to change what you're doing. Paul wasn't a perfect man. He wasn't. The scripture shows us things, that imperfections in him. He wasn't a perfect man, but he had a heart toward God. And Paul could say, hey, you're not quite ready to look at Jesus and say, I can be like that. But he's saying, can you look at me and say, well, I think I could be like that. Could, could you be an example to somebody that if they're watching your life, you'll lead them in the right way? It doesn't mean you're perfect. Paul wasn't either. But Paul was able to say, just watch me and do what I do. And folks, I want to tell you, every believer should be able to say that. It's not saying you're perfect. It's not saying everything you do is right. It's saying your heart is right. And I, it's saying my heart is right with the Lord. I love the Lord. And I will always try to do the right thing and watch me and do what I do when I mess up and do the wrong thing I also want you to see me admit that and and pray about it and be able to go on 
it's not just watch me and do what I do because everything I do is right. It's also watch me and see what I do when I do something that's wrong. See how I handle that. So as a believer, we should either be able to say, watch me and do what I do because that's a whole lot that's a small that's a whole lot smaller step than saying watch Jesus and do what he does and it will give them more hope okay that's not even the verse I was after so but but I love that verse and I think we should be able willing to say to a new believer hey let me let me help you walk through this thing let me come along beside you and and teach you not how to live a perfect life, but how to live a godly life. Okay, verse number 18. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct show they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. Their future is eternal destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things. And all they, now listen to this, it's the same thing the psalmist said. So if you thought the psalmist was being a little strong, uh, here's Paul saying, and all they think about in this life here on earth. But, he said, we're citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take these weak mortal bodies of ours and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same mighty power that he will use to conquer everything, everywhere. Powerful, powerful verses. But let me ask you a question. Would you rather be that person that's the enemy of the cross, where your future is eternal destruction, where your God is your appetite, uh, you brag about shameful things, and all, and all that they think about, is this life here on earth. Would you rather that be you, or would you rather be a citizen of heaven? Yes. Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, we'll eagerly await for him to return as our Savior. He will take these weak, mortal bodies and out of ours and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same mighty power that he will use to conquer everything, everywhere. Is our Lord going to be victorious in everything, everywhere? Yes, he is. Scripture says it plainly. Back to Psalm 36. Their course of action, the last part of verse 4, their course of action is never good. They make no attempt to turn from evil. Is that the life you want to live? We're, we've got two examples in this psalm. And uh, we've got, you can live an ungodly lifestyle. You can. You can live an ungodly life. Or, number verses number 5 through 9, tell us about a God-centered life. I just want you to feel the peace wash over you. That's what happened to me. I read that first part, and, and it felt like agitation to me. And then I got to verse number uh, 5, and I started to read that, and it was just like a peace and a calm came, came over me. Because it says, Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the ocean depths. He's giving us several of God's attributes. And my dear friends, let me tell you that these attributes are an inexhaustible resource for believers. Your unfailing love, God, is as vast as the heavens. You can't exhaust God's love. You can't get from out of, 
the presence of his love. He doesn't love you more when you're good and less when you're bad. He, his love is inexhaustible, constant, always. Everything he does in your life will be motivated by his love for you. Then it says your faithfulness. Aren't you glad we have a faithful God? That's one of his names, faithful. That means he's always going to be faithful to you. He cannot be unfaithful. It says your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. It's so vast. Your faithfulness. Verse number six, your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Those of you that have been to some of the mountain ranges, you see how powerful those, those mountains are. It, your righteousness is like mighty mountains. And then it says your justice is like the ocean depths. People, uh, sometimes folks, we want to think, that, and I've said this to you before, but it bears repeating, God does not balance his attributes. His justice does not balance his love, and nor does his love balance his justness. God is 100% love all the time, and he's 100% just all the time. And they don't... You know, we have traits that balance us out as a person. God's not like us. He has attributes, and, he, and that simply means that those things that define him, that is who he is, and it never changes. So we have a God that has unfailing love. His love for you cannot fail. His love for you is not based on what you do, how you live, or how you act, or what you say. His love is not based, for you, is not based on you. His love for you is not about who you are or who I am. His love for me is about who he is. He doesn't love me because I'm Brenda Lane. He loves me because he's God. Takes a little of the pressure out of life, doesn't it? Okay, and the last part of that verse says, you care for people and animals alike, O Lord. Hey, do you think God loves animals? You know, when we were teaching on heaven, I taught a week and maybe two on animals. But when I say, do you think God loves animals? Remember the ark. It wasn't just... Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives. It was the animals. God preserved them and saved them in the ark. They don't have souls. They don't make decisions for Christ. They do exactly what they were created to do. And maybe that's why God loves them so much, huh? They, they just do what he created them to do. And, and I was reminded of that verse uh, in the New Testament that says, not a sparrow falls to the ground that God doesn't know. Not one little worthless bird out of a million falls to the ground that God's not aware of it. What a great and wonderful God we have. Verse number seven, how precious is your unfailing love. Oh, my friend, if you don't remember one word that's been said in here today, would you please remember that God has an unfailing love for you? So that when you mess up, when you sin, that you can be reminded, yeah, I sinned, but God has an unfailing love for me. That's why Jesus died on the cross. I'm not perfect, but he is.
But all, folks, all of these attributes, though, I want you to particularly remember that one because I think it's important that we always know God loves us no matter what and that everything he does is for our good, no matter what. It may not feel good. We may not even put it in category good. But we've got to always know that whatever happens, God is going to use it for our good. He always has your best interest at heart. But his love, his faithfulness, his righteousness, his justice, there is no, they're inexhaustible, all of them. It means they're always there, no matter what. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. Remember we talked last week about a little chicken under his mother's wing, how it's a place of warmth, safety, comfort, and how a shelter is a hiding place. You and I have a hiding place, and his name is Jesus. Number eight, you feed them with the abundance of your own house letting them drink from your rivers of delight. He's a God of provision. He's going to provide for his children. Verse number nine says, for you are the fountain of life, the light by which we see. Wasn't it Ponce de Leon that was looking for the uh, fountain of youth? Well, he didn't find it, nor is there such a thing, but there is a fountain of life. And his name is Jesus. For you are the fountain of life. And then he says, the light by which we see. And the Psalm 119 tells us that his word lights our path. But God is the light that leads us day by day and step by step. Verse number 10. Pour out your unfailing love on those who love you. David is saying, God, just always be who you are. God doesn't need to hear that from David, but David needs to say that to God. Because God's going to always continue to be who he is. But I think, you know, uh, it's, he says, give justice to those with an honest heart. And you know, I'll often, and I've even said, I'd rather have grace than justice. <laughs> But when we say things, when a believer says, I don't want justice, we're usually referring to our sin. And I don't want justice where my sin is concerned because if I got justice, it would be hell. I don't want that. I want God's grace and mercy. But those who have an honest heart, can I just tell you that God's justice is right and good all of the time? Not something to be feared, but something to be cherished. Verse number 11 says, don't let the proud trample me and don't let the wicked push me around. I think, reading uh, the study that we've done in Psalm I, and uh, everything that David has said on this subject, I think David had a fear. And I think his fear was that he would let God down. I think his fear was that he would do something wrong or bring reproach upon the name of God because he said you know David said I have I have proclaimed you to everybody I have danced publicly and praised you and now Lord if I do something and I mess up what are all those people going to think about you so I think David, and don't you feel that sometimes? I pray uh, pretty often, Lord, please don't let me bring re do anything that would bring reproach upon your name. I don't want to ever bring reproach upon the name of my Savior. And I, I think David uh, isn't expressing here a fear that God won't be God or God won't do what he's supposed to do. I think David has a fear that David won't do what he's supposed to do. 
Well, he's got a history, doesn't he? So, just like us, he's got a history. So, he said, don't let the proud trample me and don't let the wicked push me around. In other words, re, re, he's asking God through his life, reserve your own integrity. It's not about David. It's about God. God, reserve your, or preserve your own integrity. Look, they have fallen. They have been thrown down, never to rise again. Folks, let me tell you something. Any unbeliever, as long as there is breath in their body, there's an opportunity for them to repent and be saved. Now, after they die, after anyone dies, it's settled then. You don't get to change your mind and make a different decision after you die. But until that moment that breath leaves your body, you can. But if a person refuses and they go out of this life as an unbeliever, an enemy of the cross, hell is a real place. And oh, my friend, there are, you know, a few years back, if I asked a group this size, uh, and I don't want you to raise your hands this morning, but if I, was to, if I were to say to you back then, how many of you got saved because uh, you wanted to go to heaven? And there'd be some raise their hand. How many of you got saved because you don't want to go to hell? Lots of hands. But now, in the day that we're living, and I think we have to be careful of this, I would also say, how many of you got saved for what God can do for you right now? How many of you just want God to bail you out of your financial troubles, your family troubles, your relationship problems? Oh, my friend, there's a heaven to be gained and there's a hell to shun. We should want to go to heaven. We should not want to go to hell. There's descriptions of both in God's word. And do you know Jesus talked about hell more than he did heaven? He didn't want anybody to go there. And he made a way not to, but hell is a, going to be a terrible place for eternity. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, a fire that burns, but it doesn't burn anything up. A bottomless pit, darkness. The description of hell is atrocious. It's horrible. Don't ever be guilty of looking at somebody and saying, go to hell. No. We don't want anybody to go there. Do everything you can do. Snatch as many back from that pit as you can. Because it's forever. And then it tells us about heaven. No tears. Joy, happiness, everybody's heart's right with God. Where do you want to go? You will go to one or the other. You say, well, I don't believe in either one of them. It doesn't make a bit of difference. <laughs> doesn't change it one bit, whether you believe in it or not. I've heard Christians say, I don't believe there's a literal hell. Well, okay, doesn't change it. What I believe about it doesn't change it. What you believe about it doesn't change it. The Bible says there is a literal heaven and hell. Every one of you will make a choice on where you spend eternity. You'll either accept what Jesus did on the cross, my friend. He made a way. You will either accept him as your Savior, and if you do, you'll go to heaven. But my dear friend, if you don't, there's an eternity in hell waiting for you. And you know what? I say that with tears in my eyes. Do what you can to win as many as you can. Be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. 
Be somebody that people will want what you've got. Be a joyful Christian, not a complainer and a griper. Listen, we hear enough of that business. I don't want to hear it out of y'all's mouths. And I don't want you to hear it out of mine. I want to lift up the name of Jesus always. Not just by what I say, but by how I live. And ask anybody that knows me very well, I'm a far cry from anything that even resembles perfect. But I have a perfect Savior. I'll go to heaven not because of who I am. But I will go to heaven because of who Jesus is. And who God is. And that unfailing love that he has for me. And that unfailing love that he has for you. Our Heavenly Father, our hearts overflow with joy when we think about heaven. And our hearts tremble in fear when we think about hell. And hell was not prepared for mankind. You told us that and you told us that you made a way that we wouldn't have to go there, that we would just accept what Jesus did on the cross, believe that he died on the cross, he was buried, he rose again, and he's coming back. And ask Jesus into our hearts. Father, you made it so easy that many children have experienced it. We're thankful that the plan of salvation is so easy and so simple that we can understand it. And we pray for many to be saved in these latter days. Father, may our churches reach out. May we as individuals reach out. That many people would be saved as we hurtle toward the end of this thing. Father, we love you and we're so grateful. And when we look at the life of an unbeliever and the life of a believer, oh, how easy that choice is. We're grateful that you gave us an opportunity to believe in a Savior, a perfect Savior. Bless your word, Father. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.